cover angelology tonight concerning our teaching angelic offices. We're covering angelic offices. So again, our outline, theological studies outline. That thing can be found at our website, bbcenglish.org. Please look that up. That way you can see uh, which part of the study that we're at. So this one is online. We're almost wrapping things up, so praise the Lord. We're wrapping things up. That way we can get to our new study. All right, let's start off with Office of Angels. Let's start off with Office of Angels. In the Office of Angels, the first one is obviously angels themselves. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. We're not going to turn there for time's sake, but I'll be writing these out. And 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. 1 Peter 1, 12 and Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. So what's interesting concerning these angels is that not only are they interested in their service for God, but angels are also interested in the service of Christians. They are interested in the Christian service as well. So it's not only ministering to God and helping out whatever service that God wanted. The angels are also focusing on you Christians as well. They're also focusing on you Christians as well. Now, contrary to popular belief, angels do not have wings. Good. They often appear in the guise of men. It's found. These verses are proof that angels do not have wings. They do not have wings. The following verses prove these. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13, as well as Judges chapter 6, verse 21 through 22. And then we're going to stop it right here. For those of you watching us online, you can just simply rewind the videos for these verses. And then people in here, you already have the paper, so you don't have to write them out. Luke chapter 24, verse 4, and Acts chapter 1, verse 10. So the writer of Hebrews, he warns us to be prepared to take care of angels unawares at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. So in this passage, it shows that angels, they can come unexpectedly to us in the guise of men. So you never know. You never know who, who you might come across that could be an angel. So unawares just drop up. If you watched our Basic Doctrines teaching on angels or angelology online through our Basic Doctrine study, I don't have to cover more concerning angels. You already know that particular teaching. So I'm going to cover here a little bit more specifics. So one of them is Gabriel. So we do know one of the angels' name. His name is Gabriel. He is found at the book of Daniel, chapter 8 and verse 16. And then he's also found in the passage of Daniel once more, chapter 9, verse 21. And then Luke chapter 1, verse 19 and 26. Now one thing we do know about this office of the angel Gabriel is that he was related to two things in the Bible, which is the first and second coming of Christ. So that was his role in the Bible, which is pretty interesting. So there's probably more of a role that Gabriel does, but all we know <laughs> on what he has mentioned in the Bible, it is related to first and second coming every time. The second coming of Christ was when he gave the wisdom to Daniel about the latter end. And then he announced the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus at Luke chapter 1. So it seems like Gabriel has a role concerning about the first and second comings of Christ. Lucifer, he is not an angel. I don't know if some of you didn't know that. Lucifer is not an angel. What he is is that he transforms himself to an angel of light. But he is not an angel. What you must understand is that he is actually, we're going to be covering him later on, what he actually is. So we'll cover him a little later on. This is done in subtle imitation. So what he does is that he's not an angel, but he can transform 
into the angel of light. And this is done to mimic Jesus Christ. This is done to try to mimic Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. We know that Jesus is the light. Amen? Amen. So Jesus is the light of the world. And that is found in John chapter 8 and verse 12. John chapter 8 and then verse 12. Now let's talk about the office of seraphims. So now we know the office of angels. Now let's talk about the office of seraphims. So what is a seraphim? Believe it or not, seraphims, they're probably the most rare kind of angelic creatures that are mentioned in the Bible. So we covered the office of angels. Now let's cover the office of seraphims. Okay, so concerning the seraphims, what do we know about them? Okay, I notice here that the stand is blocking the Mevo, so a lot of people wouldn't be able to read that, so let me move that out of the way. Okay, so then concerning the office of seraphims, what do we know about these group of people right here? So the seraphims, what they do is we're going to turn to uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2, please. We're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 6, and then we'll read verse 2 through 7. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2 through 7, not much is known about the seraphims. They're mentioned only once, but what we do know is this. They have a connection to spiritual fire. They have a connection to spiritual fire. That's one thing we do know about the seraphims. And not only that, it's also interesting concerning this. If their, their connection to fire is connected to several things. One, the name itself it means burning ones. So their name, seraphims, means burning ones. So they are connected to fire in some way. And not only that, through this burning process, it cleanses iniquity. It cleanses iniquity. There's where your Catholics get the idea of a purgatory cleansing sin. See that? But their idea is a fairy tale, obviously, where they think that it's only temporary and then uh, you go up to heaven. There is no such verse in the Bible that teaches that. As a matter of fact, uh, if you want a purification process of your sin, your sin is eternal. So you're going to have to burn forever in hell. That's why God created that. How about that? All right, we're going to turn to Isaiah uh, chapter 6, verse 2. Notice what the Word of God says right here concerning about the seraphims. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And then you'll notice that three, four, five, six, seven. They said holy, holy to the Lord. And then verse 5 through 7, notice this, the connection with fire. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. There's your purgatory right there. How about that? Uh, Catholics got it all wrong. Let's also cover two doctrinal errors concerning these seraphims. So then we covered one already, and that's concerning the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. Look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, please. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. So there are two doctrinal errors in here. One of them is concerning the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. Purgatory is actually nonsense here, concerning the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. What we're going to find out is that some Catholics, they, could, they may use this passage to prove that uh, purgatory of fire to purge sins, but they fail to see that people are purged by the blood, not fire, in this New Testament day and age. That's how we're saved. So in this particular case, it's totally different with Isaiah. But there is no case right here where it talks about a group of people in a middle world between heaven and hell and then when they get burned in the fire then they can go up to heaven there is no such verse in the bible the only verse that shows you how your sins are cleansed and purged 
where you can go to heaven is only by the blood of Amen. Jesus Christ. And that's found at Hebrews chapter 9. And notice what the Bible says right here at verse 14. Tell the Catholics this. Tell the Catholics, do you believe in purgatory? Yes, I believe in purgatory. And you tell them this. All right, so this is what the Bible says about purgatory. Don't take it back now. How much more then uh, shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience? Oh, this is the opposite of purgatory right here. From dead works to serve the living God. So it's not a counting on your works where you're purged in the fire and you get out of there. No, works are considered dead and your sins are purged by the blood of Jesus Christ. And tell your Catholic friend, there's your purgatory. Right? That's your purgatory. Amen. All right, so then another thing right here is concerning the charismatics, the charismatics. So we see that this is knocked off the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. And then we also see the other doctrine that is knocked off right here concerning the charismatics. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse, uh, excuse me, I should put number 3 here. Okay, Acts chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. Acts chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. So this is another passage we're going to notice right here is that charismatics, they would like to use this passage in Isaiah, where the fire touches the tongue. So thus, there is such a thing as tongues of fire, according to the Pentecostal Assemblies of God's teaching. However, they see, what they fail to see, is that it, it was tongues like as of fire at the book of Acts. Tongues like as of fire. By the way, you don't see Isaiah speaking in tongues at the book of Isaiah 6, 2 through 7. You never saw that. You never saw that at all. He wasn't speaking in tongues once he got the tongues of fire. If you have the tongues of fire, you know what that means? That means you must have a sin problem that God had to purge and clean. How about that? So if they're speaking in tongues, then you can point out to them, do you really believe that God put fire on your tongue? And they say yes. And then you can tell them, well, that means that you must have a sin problem, that means. You must have a sin problem. All right, look at the book of Acts, chapter 2. And then we're going to read verse 3 through 4. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues of fire. Well, maybe your NIV might say that. <laughs> cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Notice verse 3, it's not a tongue of fire. Look at verse 4. Speak with what? Other tongues, see? So that's proof of different languages. That's proof of different languages. It's not one heavenly language that they all had. It's all kinds of different tongues over here. Oh, this is a, another thing to think about, is that if we truly believe that there is such a thing called a heavenly language, why in the world did God have multiple tongues right here that are all different? Ah, uh, that's good. Ask them that question. That does not make sense at all. Okay, look at Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3 again. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. Another thing we know concerning about these seraphims is that they praise at the presence of God. They praise at the presence of God. So that's what we do know concerning about these seraphims is that these are like the choir singers, all right? So in other words, they're like the total opposite of Robert, and they're the much similarity with Sister Danielle. So that's a good example of a seraphim. In the Bible. So we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. Isaiah chapter 6 and then verse 3. That's still pretty to Jesus. Yeah, the, there, there we go. We lost one church member. Now. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 6 and then verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So that's your job. The job of the seraphims. Yeah is to sing to the presence of the Lord. And I'm sure Brother Robert can sing much better than them when he has his glorified body. And, uh, he'll be shouting <laughs> yeah, the praise the Lord. Amen. 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 All right, then. All right, I want my number back. Okay, so let's go to, let's, now let's see these seraphims, how they're described right here. So what do they look like, Pastor? So in this verse, you'll notice verses 2 through 3, you notice this, they have six wings in total. You notice that? Yeah. In verses 2 through 3, we see that the total right here, when their wings are twain, they've got six wings. Right. That's the to totality of their wings. Another thing right here is that they have two wings that cover the face. You notice that in the ver verses 2 through 3? Two wings cover the face. And then we see another two wings right here. 
that cover their feet. Now, why is that? Why do they have wings that cover their feet and their face? That is so weird. Why would God create them that way? The reason why, my friend, is because they're singing holy, holy, holy to the Lord. And when God is holy, God says, don't look at me, covering the face. And at the east, it is known that the king's subjects, that they would have their gar garments covering all the way down, including their feet, out of respect when they're in the presence of the ruler. Think about Moses. Take off the shoes from off thy wife. Feet. See, at the holiness of God, your feet and your face is covered. It's a good picture of basically, see, from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head, when you're at the presence of God, you've got to be what? It's totally holiness to the Lord. And so the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, it's got to be surrendered to Him. Mm. That can be a sermon that's right there. Yeah, that's one, good, of, one of you disciples can make a sermon out of that, actually. Yeah. It'll be a great <laughs> sermon. <laughs> All right. Then. So let's cover now the office of cherubims. The office of cherubims. Okay. Cherubim, so what do they do? There's a lot of detail on the cherubims, actually. There's a lot of detail concerning about the office of cherubims. So let me move this out of the way, that way people can see online. All right, so concerning the office of cherubims, they have way more detail than the seraphims. We see a lot of detail concerning the cherubims. For one, we know that they're similar with seraphims. They're similar. They're very similar with seraphims. In what way? Well, in what way? We're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 1 and Revelation 4. Now, you want to bookmark these two places. Ezekiel 1 and Revelation chapter 4. You want to bookmark these two places. Why, Pastor? Because then you'll be sorry when you're going to miss a lot of golden nuggets in the following verses. Mm, come on. So you want to bookmark these places. All right. They fly with six wings, just like uh, the seraphims have six wings. They praise the Trinity, like the seraphims praise the Trinity. And then they also are connected with fire. That's the reason why, here's an important note to understand. An important note to understand is that's why it makes so much sense pe why people mistake the seraphims to the cherubims and Revelation chapter 4. But we're going to find out that Revelation chapter 4, these are not seraphims. That's a mistake. Okay? So you want to remember that. The mistake that nearly a lot of preachers make, except Bible-believing preachers, is that nearly all pastors, excluding Bible-believing preachers, think that Revelation 4 is referring to seraphims. That is not true. These are referring to the cherubims. Cherubims. They're very similar. But the cherubims, what we're going to find out right here is concerning the difference, how it can be proven, is with Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel 1 specifically says cherubims, and it matches with Revelation 4, thus we know they're the same. Okay, look at verses 5 through 13. From 5 through 13, you'll notice that uh, in verse 5 through 13, notice that every one four had four wings, and then you'll notice in verse 8, they had uh, the wings on their four sides. Notice that they four had their faces and their wings at verse, uh, at verse 8. And then you'll notice that at verse uh, 11, two wings of every one were joined one to another. That matches with Isaiah concerned about the wings being twain. You're also going to notice that in verse 11, their wings were stretched upward. And notice two covered their bodies. See that? That makes sense with the seraphims, how they had two wings covering their face. And then you're also going to notice right here that at verse 13 it talks about coals of fire. See that? So then the fire is connected with them as well. So then you'll notice right here that they had wings covering themselves. And I think in, within this passage, uh, I can't find it right now, but somewhere in this passage you mentioned about covering their feet, but I could be wrong. Anyway, let's look at Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. This is a passage, a lot of people mistake this to be the seraphim, but that's not true. We're going to look at verse 7 through 8. The first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a cat, the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about. They were full of eyes within, and they 
Rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Notice that's the same thing that the seraphim said to the Lord. So thus the cherubims do the similar thing that the seraphims do. Now, the reason why a lot of people would think that this has to be more proven to be seraphims and cherubims, so then what they're going to point out right here, one of the arguments, is that Ezekiel chapter 1 had four faces and four wings which contradicted the one face and six wings at Revelation chapter 4. Okay, so look at right here, Ezekiel chapter 1. At verse 6, everyone had four faces. See that? Four faces. So, but whereas Revelation chapter 4, you'll notice that verse 6, it's talking about one face for each cherubim, or for an angelic be being. We'll say that for our argument's sake right here. So then right here, that's why they're arguing it most likely would be seraphim, especially since they're singing holy, holy to the Lord. Now, the reason why we strongly believe these are cherubims is because if you look at Ezekiel chapter 1, it specifically said cherubim. Not only that, all the features that the seraphims had matched with the cherubim as Ezekiel chapter 1. Another thing which is even stronger is that Ezekiel chapter 1, it mentioned about the... Faces that match with Revelation chapter 4. It matched with the faces. So the, it mentioned about the lion, it mentioned about the man, it mentioned about the eagle, and then a calf, which is almost similar with the ox at Ezekiel chapter 1. But I'm going to show why there's a difference later on. But aside from that, you'll notice lion, man, eagle matches up at Ezekiel chapter 1 with Revelation chapter 4. So there's no doubt these beings are related to each other. These beings are related to each other. But let's prove the case right here. There were four faces and four wings, which contradicts the one face and six wings at Revelation 4. Because at Ezekiel 1, it not only said four faces at verse 6, it says everyone had four wings. See that? But Revelation chapter 4 said how many wings? Six. six. So then this is a contradiction right here. Uh -uh. All right, so what we're going to explain right here is this. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 10, it's possible John, he's... I better write this all out. Woo! All right, here we go. All right, so then they assume that Ezekiel chapter 1 is not the same as Revelation chapter 4. All right, but that's not true. We're going to cover several cases. So the first point right here is that let's open up to the possibilities. You can't make a conclusion without overlooking possibilities. You have to be open to all facts. You can't be narrow-minded and bigoted. you got to be open to all facts. So be open to all possibilities, all arguments, before you make a conclusion. It's possible that John, he saw only one side of the four faces. Mm. So that's a possibility you got to think about. It's possible he saw only one side of the four faces with the beings of Revelation chapter 4. Ezekiel may have seen only four of the six wings. Why? since two of them were clipped onto the other wings. Look at Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 18. It says right here, uh, Ezekiel chapter, no, uh, it's not chapter 1, verse uh, 18, probably 8. Yeah, verse 8. Uh, let's see, no, nope. verse 9. Wow, uh, that is a mistake in your notes. You might want to erase that and write down verse 9. I wrote verse 18. In my head I was probably going, 9 plus 9 equals 18. <laughs> Maybe that's what happened. You better thank God I did not translate your King James Bible. Yeah. <laughs> you saw a lot of, lot of scribal error. Now, don't say amen now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So notice that verse 9, their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went everyone straight forward. So notice right here that Ezekiel may have seen only four of the six wings. Why? Since two of them were clipped onto the other wings. Amen. That's, That's why right. at verse 10, at verse uh, 10, we see that he saw uh, the four faces, mm -hmm. but then John could have saw one side of the faces. Yeah. Ezekiel mentioned in verse 6 he saw four wings, but then the reason why is because the other wings that they were clipped onto the other ones. So that's a possibility. But let's build up the arguments even more where it becomes solid, okay? The cherubims, so this is a simple one as well. The cherubims that Ezekiel saw was on a different time plane.
than what John saw. You gotta understand that fact. Mm, so a lot of things can happen. So that's another possibility you gotta think about. Is that what Ezekiel saw, this was thousands of years ago, you understand. What Ezekiel saw was on a different time plane. This should be simple to understand concerning dispensationalists. Now, if you're anti-dispensational, then yeah, you're free to object to this. You don't have to believe in that. But for dispensationalists, this is not hard to understand. What Ezekiel saw was on a different time plane. A lot of things can happen. You gotta understand. A lot of things can happen. Even God. Oh no, God never changed. Hey man, God manifested himself in the flesh. That happened at the book of John chapter 1. That was a totally different time plane. That was different from compared to back then in the Old Testament. See, a lot of things can happen. Now, I understand a lot of things can happen at that time. All right, another one is this. The four beasts in Revelation chapter 4 verse 7 in matches with the four living creatures at Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 5. Now look at this. Look at those verses, Revelation chapter 4, verse 7. So notice it says four beasts, right, at one passage. And then it says at the other passage, four what? Living creatures. Four living creatures. Why would it say four right here? See? So there's a lot of resemblances. A lot of resemblances right here. Both of them, you'll notice at verse 7 and verse 10, nearly have the same identical faces. So that's one right here. So I argued that before. They have identical faces. They match. A second point right here is that both of their presences are filled with what? Many eyes. They have a lot of eyes all around them. That's found at verses 8. And verse 18. Verse 8 and verse 18. So notice that the four beasts and the four living creatures at Revelation 4 and Ezekiel 1, they match. They match. They have identical faces and their presences are filled with many eyes. So because there's so many things right here that matches up with each other, these cherubims got to match up with the ones at Revelation chapter 4. Now, unlike the seraphims, the cherubims have a little more info. So, no doubt about that. We saw the seraphims at rarely, rarely. But in the Bible, the Lord uses them. This is an interesting point, and this can be a floodgate to a lot of interesting doctrines. Is that concerning these cherubims, they, the Lord uses them as surroundings. That's something important to understand. The Lord uses these cherubims as surrounding. Let's look at three passages here. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. And then Exodus chapter 25, verse 22. And then Psalms chapter 18, verse 10. So you're going to turn over there, but uh, I'm not going to read it for time's sake. I'm not going to read it for time's sake. But look at those passages. You'll notice how God used one, the cherubim, as a what? Surrounding the Garden of Eden. At Exodus, surrounding for the mercy seat of the tabernacle. The mercy seat of the tabernacle. And then at Psalms chapter 18, verse 10, this is extremely interesting. Joe's right here as if like there's a rapture going on or when God is ascending upward that he's riding on the wings of a chair. Now, your imagination can run wild with that one. So we won't know too much about that. It might be conjecture at best what you might have in mind concerning the rapture connected to Psalms chapter 18 verse 10. But see, that doctrine, if you believe that cherubims are used for surroundings, that can be a floodgate to a lot of things in your own research, in your own time. So it might be very interesting. Who knows? Maybe we might ride on the wings of a cherub. I just don't know. I really don't know. So, but it is very interesting about this case. But, you know, it also shows a lot of interesting things concerning about UFOs and stuff like that. I mean, there are wheels connected to the feet of the cherub. And then, you know, you ride those objects when you go upwards. So there might be something to that. I don't know. 
might be something to that. I don't know. I do know this. Just a, This is not part of your discipleship, but I'm just going to give you uh, something, a free bonus, all right? A free bonus. The Ark of the Covenant, it was like hovering upward, and then what were the images? The cherubims. And the mercy seat, which where God sat to communicate at the tabernacle, he was in the middle there. Mm, like that food for thought, you know, something like that. You never know. You never know. All right, now, the cherubims we see right here at uh, number three. So, uh, point number three right here. God uses them for surroundings. Cherubims are used for surroundings. Please let me know if there's anything wrong with the sound or anything with the screen picture no, while I'm teaching. Thank you so much. All right, so then Genesis chapter 3. Verse 24, and then Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, and then Psalms chapter 18, verse 10. All right, the next one we're going to talk about is the archangel. Now, he's a very interesting person, the archangel. Why do I say he? Because there's only one. There's no such thing as three, five, or something like that, something weird like that. There's only one. So... The Bible says, we're not going to turn there for time's sake, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. You know what the Bible says? The voice of the archangel. So as if there's only one. But the archangel, he plays a part with the rapture of the church. Mm -hmm. That's his, going to be his role, which is interesting. The archangel, his role is going to be toward the rapture of the church, which is extremely interesting right here. Now, people will say that Gabriel, Michael, and Lucifer are the three archangels in the Bible, including Ra Raphael and Donatello and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and stuff, like that kind of stuff. But you got to realize this, okay? That kind of stuff is non-biblical. That is non-biblical. It is, it is fairy tale nonsense, and if we're going to be very open-minded, it is only conjecture at best. Yeah. Because there is no Bible yeah. verse. No Bible verse. So... Well, you know, the book of Enoch says this. Well, you know, the book of Enoch, if it did say that, then it's wrong. I don't know if it did, but it, even if it did say that, it's wrong. Because the Bible says at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, and Jude chapter 1, verse 9, it says the archangel. So why would there be the archangel, huh? It shows that there's only one. It only shows there is one archangel that plays a role. All right, another thing right here is the archangel is described to be a prince standing for the nation of Israel. That's found in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. So in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, we see right here that the archangel, he is described to be a prince for the nation of Israel. So if you're anti-Semite, if you're against the nation of Israel, you got a problem, man. Amen. The archangel then is going to have to change his role. He's going to have to say, hey, Father, I, I thought that the Israel was replaced, so shouldn't I be the prince of the church? And Jesus Christ says, no, that's my bride. You're the prince of the nation of Israel. Stick to your role, okay? Stop watching YouTube and all <laughs> these kind of stuff. <laughs> Some bearded ISIS followers, you know, stuff like that. No, just, just, read, just read the Bible. Oh, okay. just, just read the Bible. <laughs> All right, so another thing is that the archangel is the only one, which is very interesting. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9, and Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. He's the only being, which is extremely interesting, who, went, who fought against Satan. He's the only one in the Bible who fought against Satan. So does that mean he has the same power as Satan? Well, if you look at the book of Jude, actually Michael does not bring a railing accusation against him. So he can only do it when God allows and gives him the power. So it shows that Satan is extremely powerful. So you'll see right here that an archangel is a very high class angelic office, but there's a cherubim. It could be that they could compete, or there's one special being that is so special as a cherubim, that he outclassed the archangel. Thus, now let's talk about this one, the office of the cherub. That's the most interesting thing tonight. The office of the cherub. So let's cover this. 
So the fifth point is the office of the cherub right here. And then we covered this as the point number four. So the cherub. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter, uh, we won't turn there for time's sake actually, but Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 7. The word cherub, it can be two things right here. One, it could be a singular form for cherubim. It's a singular form for cherub. Well, I knew that, preacher. Good. So keep that in your mind. But it can also mean, it can, the thing can refer to actually a special class, Satan as the ox. No, I don't believe that. Well, you got to attend a Bible-believing church where they can show you this kind of stuff. So look at Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. Okay, here's the fun stuff. Ready? All right, and you want to keep your hands over here. That way we can go back and forth. All right, Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 1. Notice what the Bible says here. It came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, and the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. Okay, this is by the river of Kibar. And then at verse 10, as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man... Lion, ox, eagle, right? At verse 10. Okay, remember those four. Match that with Ezekiel uh, 10, verse 14 now. Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 14. And everyone had four faces. Okay, we saw that. Now, all, before I continue reading that one though, let's look at verse 20. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Kibar. And I knew that they were of the cherubims. So that matches with Ezekiel 1. It's the same creatures that Ezekiel saw. There's no doubt about it. Do you believe it? Okay, if you believe they are the same creatures, look what he saw then. At verse 14. The first face was the face of an ox. No, it said cherub. The second face was the face of a man. Third, the face of a lion. The fourth, the face of an eagle. All right, if you're King James Bible believer, then who is that then? See, I'm right. It's referring to the ox. Well, it's not Satan. Well, did you read Ezekiel chapter 28? Go to Ezekiel 28. So keep your hand at those places. But Ezekiel chapter 28. And then verse 14. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14. Notice right here that Satan, he is what? Thou art the anointed cherub right. that cover it. Yep. All right, let's also see in this case. There are four cherubims in heaven. That's what we saw in Revelation chapter 4, verse 7. Four cherubims. Okay, makes sense, preacher. Ah, but this is where we go deeper in doctrine. Come on. Remember, Satan is no longer a cherub. He lost his position up in heaven, that's a matter of fact, okay? Satan, he is no longer the cherub up in heaven, okay? So he, if he's no longer up there, then what's going on at Revelation chapter 4, verse 7? Why are there four? Huh? Why are there four? That doesn't make sense. So that means that there were originally, how many cherubims? That means there were originally five cherubims. He was a fifth cherub. That's what you're going to hear quite often. Now think about this. If all four are the eagle, lion, man, and calf at Revelation chapter 4, right? Where are we? Revelation what? Four, right? There are how many cherubims? Four, right? Okay, if they're still up there, then what is Satan? Satan was, is not one of those four cherubims at Revelation 4. Calf, lion, man, eagle, right? Then who is he then? He's got to be the fifth then. There must have been five cherubims then. But another thing is, who is he then? He has to be the missing ox. Why is that, preacher? The reason why he's definitely the mix, missing ox is that because we saw Ezekiel chapter 28 and Ezekiel chapter 10 and Ezekiel chapter 1 that he is known to be as the what? Cherub. Cherub. See? So thus we know that he is the missing ox right here. Now a lot of people, they might, they're going to try to say that the calf is the same as the ox at Revelation 4 and Ezekiel chapter 1. Well, one, if you're a King James Bible believer, if you look at 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 32, they're not the same. In 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 32, it shows that the calves, the calf, 
is separated from the ox. Not only that, that's just even basic common sense in science. Calf is different from the ox. But another thing which is very interesting is this. It, so then why, why is that the case then? It could be that maybe, maybe, that the Lord just knocked off the horns from this creature and he became a calf instead maybe. Thought about that. Maybe that's interesting. But there's a lot of things that could have happened. I don't know. But we're not going to cover that tonight. But you can start thinking. And then when you start thinking, it's going to make a lot more sense why you're going to have to do it this way. There's going to be a lot of interesting things and a lot of things are going to make sense later on. That's all I'm going to say because I don't have time. But in, over here, the cherubims, what is very interesting about them is that they interestingly match with the six clap with the six classes of vertebrae creatures. In other words, those with backbone, so to speak. Why is that, preacher? Well, what you're going to find out right here is that they cover mammals, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and humans. Now, the four cherubims cover the classes of mammals, domesticated and wild. We can see that. It covers calf and lion. It also covers the class of birds, so there's the eagle. And then it covers the class of humans, there's the man. But then here's the thing now, is that what's going to, the missing classes of creatures then that we see are amphibians, reptiles, and fish. They're the ones that are missing. So then, who are they going to match up with? Look at Isaiah chapter 27, and then Revelation chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 27, and Revelation chapter 12. It is very interesting that all classes of God's creation and creatures is covered through all of these cherubims, through all of these cherubims. But you're going to notice that there's a missing class, amphibians, fish, reptiles are missing. Why is that? The reason why is Satan, he covers aquatic reptilian animals. Yeah. You want me to make it even simpler than that? You just want one class of creature? He covers cold-blooded creatures. Mm. How about that? You know, what those you know what those creatures are? Cold-blooded. In science, they're known to be cold-blooded, these creatures. It makes sense why Satan is a cold-blooded creature. Ooh, how about that? He was a murderer from the beginning, the Bible says. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1. In that day, the Lord with the sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing what? Serpent. serpent. There's your reptile. Even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the what? Dragon. Amphibian. That is in the where? Sea. Fish. See, he covers all those classes. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3 and verse 9. Notice right here, it says, And there appeared... Another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. Notice he has horns, right? Just like the ox has horns. Huh, interesting. Anyways, verse 9, notice that old, what, serpent. That matches with Isaiah. There's no doubt. That's Satan. Called the devil, that's Satan. Okay, there, that's plain. That's Satan, okay? He covers a reptile. Another thing that's interesting is that he covers uh, one more class of creature that you might notice is that the one class of creature is the one without the vertebrae, and then we're going to cover the anthropods right here. Look at Luke chapter 11, verse 15. Chapter 11, verse 15. Thus we can see this was a special, there is absolutely no doubt, there is such a thing as a special class of cherub, special class of creature. We're going to look at Luke chapter 11. And then we'll read verse 15. Notice what the Word of God says right here concerning about Satan. What does he cover? The Bible says, but some of them said he casted out the devils through who? Beelzebub. You know what Beelzebub means? It means Lord of the Flies. Lord of the Flies. How about that? This was no doubt a special class of creature. Thus, it is interesting how cartoons draw Satan with horns, a cleft foot, a serpentine tail, and a red-colored body in totality. Very interesting. 
Remember, cherubims are known for their surroundings, right? So let's close it off right here. So we're not going to turn to these verses, but remember, cherubims are known for their surroundings, correct? We saw that. Psalms 99, verse 1, Revelation chapter 4, and verse 6. They surround the Lord's throne while God is sitting in the middle. Now think about this. They're known to be surroundings. There's only one opening left. You got the four cherubims that surround the throne, and God is in the center. There's only one opening space. That's the top. Well, if you got four cherubims that already covered God, then where would the fifth cherubim go? The top. Is that true, Pastor? In Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14, you know what the verse says? Satan is the covering. He's the covering. How about that? Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. No wonder he thought that he could be higher than God. Mm -hmm. So God, what did he do? Probably he's going to have to knock off the horns, knock off the person out of that position, make sure that it's going to be a calf with no horns on it, and then say, okay, remember, who's the one at the top? But thus, that's why in every conspiracy stuff that you see about, they always have something like some kind of antenna or horn thing on top. Always on top. Representing who is the one at the top. Rulers and beings always had some kind of triangular pointed up figure. Obelisk pointing up at the top. Everything, I will ascend, I will ascend. Who's the top of the pyramid at the conspiracy elites? Pyramid pointing up, 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 up. But no, it's God that's the one at the top. Amen. Because he is Amen. the one that covers three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's yeah. the one that totalitates everything. He's the one that completes everything. But Satan, he wants to take that for himself. So he sets up pyramids. He sets up obelisks. There's horns over every kind of creatures. And let's close for tonight, shall we? All right, so your homework assignment. Your homework assignment is going to be listening about, uh, let's see right here. Temptations, temptations. Your study is going to be over temptations. That will be your homework assignment. I will put the link below. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers. Uh, help us to grow more in knowledge of the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith 
that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.